to see you. And tonight we're going to talk about mankind, sin, and we'll touch on the spiritual world as well. Now, much of what we're going to talk about tonight, we will take back to the Bible. Uh, and there are many assumptions in the Word of God. If you simply turn to Romans chapter 3, which is a well-known uh, chapter in the Bible for us as Christians, from looking at it from a New Testament perspective. And Paul says in Romans 3, uh, verse 21, But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now even when Paul talks like that, and of course there's a huge context here in the book of Romans, but even when he talks like that, there are many assumptions. One assumption is that we live in the presence of God and that we're accountable and that we're accountable to God. The other assumption is that we need God and we need God's redemption. The other assumption here is that we are all sinners. In fact, he says that in so many words. And in Romans 3.23, we often use the verse to help people understand that they are sinners and that they are in need of God in our evangelism. It's one of the verses that we often hear people memorize to share with people when they share the gospel with them and try and help them understand that through Jesus Christ there is salvation. Even talking and mentioning, talking like that and mentioning the word salvation really means that we need salvation. And in a certain sense, that's the first step. And for many people in our modern society, uh, even that is a huge step, just the acknowledgement, I am a sinner and I'm in need of God. Now, this all goes back to the topic that we talk about tonight. In fact, it goes back to the first two topics that we talked about, which is we believe in God, and we believe that God created the universe, uh, and that uh, God holds us accountable, and that God has revealed himself, which is what we looked at last week. We go back to literally the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, God creates the whole universe, and step by step, six days, he takes a rest on the seventh day. And then Genesis chapter 2 retells the story from a slightly different perspective. It actually expands the story. It goes back to some of the animal world and, um, and the, the flower world and, and so on, or the plant world, I should say, vegetation that God created. But then it zeroes in on what was only mentioned briefly in chapter 1, and that is the creation of mankind, something we will come back to as we uh, look at that particular topic tonight. But he creates Adam. Adam is the uh, Hebrew word that is used throughout that passage for uh, mankind. Um, and perhaps the male man as we have come to know it. But primarily the focus is, as we will uh, focus on that tonight, is on mankind. God created mankind. Humankind is perhaps another way of saying that. And throughout chapter 2, that is the focus, and God, be, uh, man or mankind becomes God's representative, God's worker in the garden, and God places man in the garden. Doesn't find in the rest of creation a suitable helper for man, for Adam, and therefore puts him to sleep, and then he creates Eve uh, out of that. And it's then that, that Adam says, I have found someone who looks like me, is from my own species, my own bone and flesh, and then using a word which is no longer Adam, but the male version of man is Ish. And then the female version of that is Isha. And so you'll, you'll pick that up. So in Genesis 2, that's the story. And God creates man and woman, male and female, for each other. And um, marriage is at the, at the foundation of everything that we find over there in terms of God creating these two genders for each other puts him in the Garden of Eden, which we find in Genesis chapter 2. And then Genesis chapter 3 is something that we will also uh, come back to later on tonight. But it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, uh, that's the woman that was made in Genesis chapter 2, 
he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And uh, that goes back to Genesis chapter 2 and uh, the tree that God put there and the fact that God prohibited or prevented them, uh, commanded them not to eat of that particular tree. And here comes and probably the first suggestion of, of evil and of sin in the Bible, and that is doubt. Did God really say? And just that little bit of a doubt. Um, does God really exist uh, is something we hear again and again. Will God really hold us accountable? Uh, ultimately, who is God? And then ultimately, there is no God, and therefore I can live my life every which way. And that is the beginning of sin, just casting a little bit of doubt. And then it results in disobedience. That results in lying and hiding uh, and a distancing from God or a separation from God when Adam and Eve hide from God when He comes to commune with them. I find in chapter 3 two major spiritual truths. The one is the reality of sin and the fall of mankind and the fallenness of the human nature. And none of us can ever say, I have never sinned. And that is why I read Romans chapter 3, where Paul says, everybody is uh, unjust or does not have the righteousness of God. We have fallen into sin. And so sin causes a huge amount of disturbance. Uh, it causes separation from God. It, it brings tension within relationships. Uh, and we'll come back to that. But immediately Adam and Eve are at loggerheads, if you wish. They hide from God. They, they start blaming one another. And, and that's the entrance of sin into this world. And we all suffer from the consequences of sin. And we all sin. And in fact, we'll look at that. We all have sinned and we have sin uh, in our lives. That's the one truth that we need to understand. And you will never, and I will never really understand salvation unless I understand how lost I am. Growing up in a Christian home, in fact, in the home of a pastor, was, was a real challenge for me. This, this particular truth was a real challenge. Uh, my testimony is one of those. I grew up in a Christian home. You know, that's how it all starts out. Literally, I grew up in a Christian home. I often joke and say to people, I was born with a Bible in my hand. I mean, my dad was a pastor. They, they loved the Lord. And they, from when I was little, they taught us to, to fall in love with God, with the Bible and everything else. So at the age of five, I have a memory. I can't remember the exact date or circumstances, but I have a memory at the age of five of actually committing my life to the Lord. There have been uh, days and times and periods and seasons in my life where I have wandered from the Lord. At the age of 12, I have made another commitment to the Lord. Uh, I had more understanding by the age of 12, but still I was a child. I mean, really, if you come to think of it. But at that age, I made a commitment to the Lord. And so, growing up and then receiving a call from God or being con convinced in my heart that God called me to go into full-time ministry, I studied theology. And, and it was in studying theology and reflecting on the truth of Scriptures, that my lostness before God really became a big issue for me. Because up to that point in time, it was very easy for me to look back and, and think and say even that I wasn't really all that bad. It didn't take God that much to save me really. And it, it's a huge danger when we start thinking like that. And that is, I, I wasn't really that far. And so God only really needed to take a, a half a little step towards me. But it's the understanding that I'm lost. And if it wasn't for God's intervention in my life, I would have ended up in hell. And, and that, I think, is the biblical message. And to understand that is extremely important. There's a second truth in chapter 3 of Genesis. I don't want to elaborate on that tonight because we'll come back to that again and again in the, in the near future. But that truth is that God could have left Adam and Eve to their own devices. God could have withdrawn from his own creation. God even could have wiped it out in one single word by saying, let it be gone. Just as he said, let there be light. He could say, let there be total darkness once again. And everything would be gone and wiped out. But God didn't. And that I see as a sign of grace. God coming to the garden. Although in his mind he knew, however God my, God's mind works, but, but God knew and God knows where we are. 
and yet God pursues us. And that I see as an act of grace. So even right there in the darkness of the picture of the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, which has the title in the, in the NIV as The Fall of Man, uh, that introduces sin into this world and forever uh, in, in our human lives or in the human existence, there will be sin because every person is born into sin. Despite the dark picture, there is this light that shines into that picture. God coming, God pursuing, and then God calling, Adam, where are you? Um, and, and that really speaks to me uh, about God coming after me, God pursuing me, God wanting to draw me uh, to himself. And, and in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, in a certain sense, we have almost a summary of the message of the gospel throughout the whole of the Bible. Because it's God creating, we have humankind sinning, and we, ha we have God pursuing by his own grace and only by God's grace can we say that we are saved and so that in a nutshell is really what the gospel is all about and all the way into if we fast forward into the New Testament it's still God coming into this dark Eden world where he says where are you uh, and you can put your name in there God calls you Jesus calls you unto himself and wants you to be part of him that's what grace is all about so let's pray together and then we'll get into the lecture time together. Father, we thank you that you have never left us, that you will never forsake us, and that you didn't do that when we were sinners and now that we know you and we want to respond to, to your grace. And as we continue to respond to your grace, Lord, you, you will always be there for us. And we thank you that you are a faithful God. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds to understand and to accept what you have given to us by your own revelation. And remind us again and again about your love, your grace, and the fact that you will never leave us. Thank you for this time together tonight. We pray that you would bless us together in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as we get into the lecture time, let me remind you quickly where we have been so far. We have looked at the fact that God created everything. So you look at the universe and you know God created it. In fact, God also uses creation to reveal himself, another topic that we looked at. And uh, we have seen that uh, in nature, in general revelation, God makes himself known. But we also realize that general revelation is not enough. There needs to be what we call special and more specific revelation, and that is God speaking. And ultimately, and we'll get to the point where we talk about Jesus uh, more specifically, but Jesus is God's final revelation and God's specific revelation. We have a record of God's revelation in this book called the Bible. So the Bible is really God's special revelation, uh, referring us and taking us back to Jesus, who is God's final revelation. Our belief in God as a creator, our belief in that, that God um, revealed himself, that by his own grace he took the initiative to reveal himself, is fundamental for our understanding for everything else. Uh, because if you, number one, if you don't believe in God and you don't believe in the Bible, then there's very little point in going any further um, in an argument or uh, in a discussion, maybe I should say, with, with people around who don't believe in God or don't believe in the Bible, it's extremely difficult to find common ground. Um, the moment a person says, I don't believe in God, then that is the conversation. And that is, why don't you believe in God? And let me try and as far as possible prove to you that there is a God. Uh, and then if the person says, well, you know, there are many revelations out there, uh, I, I might as well read the Quran or this or that or the other revelation or book and, and find God, then again, we, we're not on common ground and it, we find it very difficult then to get into a, a real deep conversation with people like that. So those two things that we have looked at so far are fundamental for uh, what we believe and what we will continue to do. Tonight, we're going to look at the faith picture, uh, as I call it uh, in your notes, and, and that is we continue this journey uh, with, with those foundational blocks in place. We believe in God. We believe God uh, revealed himself. Now we're going to look at mankind. That's where we fit into uh, that picture. 
um, and, and then how sin entered into this world, and then we'll journey a little bit, and I can only really scratch the surface when it comes to the spiritual world. We don't have uh, time enough to do two, three hours worth of talking about the spiritual world, but I, I hope that I would be able to stimulate you enough, enough so that you can go and, and read further on those particular topics. Now, when you get to the reading in your Bible, I suggest Genesis 1, 2, and 3. I've already talked about that. I've alluded to Romans chapter 3. The first three chapters of Romans, in terms of the lecture time tonight, are crucial for our understanding, uh, a New Testament understanding of the things that we're going to talk about. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 14, will introduce Jesus to you, but then the comparison between Jesus, how Jesus is much more superior to the angels. And, and I, I refer to that specifically because we're going to talk about the spiritual world. And then Job chapter 1 and several other places, and, and we'll get to those places. Your textbook uh, pages are there, and um, I, I can only encourage you to continue to read both the textbooks as well as other material that you may find, other uh, books on theology. When it comes to humankind, mankind, uh, we are talking about biblical anthropology. The word anthropology comes from the combination of anthropos, which is the Greek word for man uh, or mankind, mostly man in the male form, form uh, in the Greek, and the word logos, which is a study. And I'm not going to display logos every time we get together, but anthropology is the combination of those two words. In other words, the study of man or the study of mankind. When it comes to anthropology, the question is, what is man or mankind? Who is man? What is the origin? What is the destiny? And, and the word man, whenever I refer to man, unless um, I tell you uh, exactly that that's not what I mean, uh, tonight in this lecture time, I may be referring to mankind. So oftentimes the word man will just uh, come out of my lips uh, or roll off my tongue. Um, but I mean by that, and even if you go to Genesis 1 and 2, uh, oftentimes the word man or Adam in that particular case uh, refers to mankind. Uh, the context in the Bible will tell us whether the reference is to mankind generically or whether it actually refers to man in the male version of that word. Calvin, quoted in Milne, uh, one of the books that I am using, uh, says... Humanity never achieves a clear knowledge of itself unless it has first looked upon God's face and then descends from contemplating Him to scrutinize itself. Uh, that is just making the same point that I made earlier on, and that is our understanding of God, of creation, and of God's revelation is the point of departure. Uh, and, and that is why studying humanity or mankind or anthropology from a purely humanistic point of view will never reveal everything about mankind. In, in the universities, they study anthropology, and uh, there's a lot that they learn, social behavior, language, and um, the culture of mankind, etc. And those things reveal a lot. But in terms of our relationship with God, we're talking about biblical anthropology. And then Calvin uh, is correct by saying that starts with a study of God. Who is God? And then from that perspective, I can begin to understand who I am. So biblical anthropology has its point of departure in the belief that God created us to fulfill God's purposes. And ultimately that purpose is to bring glory to God, to reflect God. Uh, and we'll talk about the image of God a bit later on. Looking at Genesis chapter 1, what we learn about mankind, and, and we don't have time to read everything there, but on the sixth day God created man or mankind. From Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 30, we read this. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. Do you see the, the jump from singular to plural? Let's make man, and let's, um, let's make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule. Immediately there's a plural uh, over the birds and, the, and so on. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Again, there's a plural. Um, and, and the whole context here is, is the plurality of mankind. So the reference here is mankind, not so much m the male version of man. 
God blessed them and said, uh, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds, the living creatures, and so on. And then God said, um, I give every seed-bearing plant on the face of the earth uh, and fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and the birds of the air, all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. So from this particular reference, we learn much about the creation of mankind. First thing is that the Trinity was at work. Let us make man. And so God, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was at work. Humans are created in God's image. Let us make man in our image. We also learn that humanity is going to rule over all creation. And in the term uh, used by many theologians, mankind is the crown of God's creation. Uh, we are so much more than the rest of creation uh, and, and therefore reflect the image of God. Humans are created male and female, uh, two genders. And humanity is blessed by God. And so God blessed, uh, God blessed all of creation because all of creation is good. But more specifically, this passage talks about the blessing that God gave for humankind. Humans are created to multiply. We, we talked a little bit about that last time. But procreation is, is part of what God created. Um, and therefore, as much as God can and could have created more human beings, in fact, it is actually a topic of debate and discussion. Did God create more humans or was it only one uh, or, or only the two people, Adam and Eve? Um, and, and that's a, a, a huge debate among uh, even Christians. And then humans are to fill the earth rule over and subdue the earth. And so there's some kind of control over the earth. And we've looked at, at that a little bit last week. And then in Genesis chapter 2, this story is expanded, as I said earlier on. There's a more detailed description in verses 15 to 25. And from those verses, we learn more about humanity. And you have to read the two together to get the full picture. They are created to work. Um, and this I referred to last week, uh, work the Garden of Eden and take care of it, take care of the earth, and so we're going to work. Um, and, and that is before the fall. And then they are accountable to God. That is when God tells them, you must not eat of this particular tree. And so they're accountable to God. The moment there is a command, it means someone is in command and others receive the command. Male and female fulfill one another. When Adam uh, saw Eve, uh, and even when God said, I need to find him uh, a helper. Uh, the, even the wording used in the Hebrew uh, is very clearly uh, that, the, that the two of them will fulfill one another, that they bring gifts and abilities and personalities and, and abilities into the relationship um, that, that would be left if the person was left single, that would be lacking. Marriage is the basis for unity. God clearly said, um, the man, now he is talking about the male person, will leave his father and mother, will cling to his wife, and the two of them um, will be one. And then there was total openness and transparency. Uh, the two of them were naked. Um, there was, um, I, I don't necessarily see the picture, although it could be literal, literally naked, uh, but, but I see it much as much more than physical nakedness. I see it as total openness and transparency, uh, these two people lived in complete harmony uh, with one another. They lived in harmony with nature, with the Garden of Eden, with, with the animal world around them. They lived in harmony with God uh, because God came and, and walked and communed with them um, and communicated with them somehow openly, uh, all of which changed with the fall uh, ultimately. Some of the general truths that we find in Genesis in terms of, of our understanding of mankind Humans have their existence in God, their creator. Uh, I, I have my very life uh, from God. It, I depend on God for, for every breath that I take. God's twofold action in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 points to man's unity and diversity. It says, uh, The Lord God formed the man, Adam, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. So the physical part of that is that God took dust. And I take dust to mean the, uh, the 
particles or the stuff from the, from the earth, uh, not necessarily dust as we, we're dusting the, the furniture, uh, but, but rather the material that, that God created in the universe or in the earth. And out of that, he formed mankind. Um, we know that ultimately when we die, says the Bible, and we know that from experience, not our own experience, but, but seeing how people die and go back to dust. Eventually they completely dissolve and disappear. They go back to the dust of the earth. So that's the physical side, but there's a spiritual side, and that is God breathed life into this body that he created, and it became the, the man became a living being. Humans are God's special creation. Um, they are the wonder of creation. Psalm 8, um, and this is really only one single reference that I want to use, uh, is, is a wonderful way in, in which the Bible authors always look to this. O Lord, our God, uh, uh, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens from the lips of children and infants. You have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you, that you care for him? So on the one hand, it says, God, you are so awesome, and creation is so wonderful. And, and, and when I look at, at how big you are, what is man? When I think about how big you are and how small I am. But then immediately the psalmist goes on. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. So it's almost like um, two different statements. The one is how small we are as human beings compared to God, but then God created human beings with wonder and crowned human beings with glory and honor. Now we know that the New Testament ultimately sees this as a fulfillment also of Jesus when he came, but I believe if, as you read Psalm 8, uh, Psalm 8 can also be applied to uh, just human beings in general. Human beings are responsible for the created order and they are uniquely related to God. Uh, that concept of the image of God uh, in us. And that's really what I want to talk about a little bit. Just talking about what it means when we, talk, when we refer to created, that we are created in the image of God. In Latin, the word is imago Dei. And if you pick up some of the theology works and so on, uh, you will find the word imago Dei often referred to. Uh, it's just become a very common reference among theologians specifically. And, and I told you at the beginning that I may just uh, refer you to and explain some of the theological language that we use uh, in these particular topics. The image of God, and this is a quote from Wikipedia, is a concept and theological doctrine that asserts that human beings are created in God's image and therefore have inherent value, independent of their utility or function. So I don't get value because of what I do, but actually of how I have been made. Because I'm made after the image of God, I have inherent value. It is this truth that sets mankind apart from the rest of creation. The, the lion, as big as it is, as part of the big five, or the elephant, or the crocodile, or the mountain, or the ocean, uh, those things have value. They, they reflect something of God and God's creative powers, but they don't reflect the image of God as human beings reflect uh, the image of God. The nature, what, what does it mean when we talk about this image of God. Imago Dei does not refer to God's physical features. And, and that's the one thing that I immediately need to get out of our minds. And that is that we look like God physically. We don't look like God. Uh, we often, in our human uh, language, we, we talk about a, a child who's a spitting image of his dad or something like that. This is not what we mean when we talk about, when the Bible talks about uh, the image of God. God is spirit, and we cannot behold God's or look at God's physical features. Even Moses, as close as he was to God, was not allowed to see God physically. Uh, he was only to see God's glory from behind. Now, mankind was created with many features or qualities, characteristics that are similar to that of God. Human knowledge, and I have the emphasis here on human but the fact that we have knowledge and that we can increase knowledge 
separates us from the rest of, crea of creation. Uh, a mountain is a mountain. Now, you can look at the, uh, and there's no real increase in knowledge or ability on the part of a mountain. Uh, and similarly, the ocean. Now, when you look at, at animals or birds or the animal world, perhaps you can argue that they have some kind of a knowledge. But primarily, animals are driven by instinct. Um, we have a little weaver, a yellow weaver in our garden, and year after year, he destroys my garden for material, building materials, to build the nests up there, uh, and then he plucks out every little uh, leave around those nests, and I have to rake them up. Because I, 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 this, this bird and I have a real battle on in my, in my garden. Um, but it is by instinct. I can, I can see it because the nests look exactly the same. They face the same direction. And year after year, he goes to the exact same ritual. Human beings can change. We change venue. We change in knowledge. We change in looks even. Uh, we grow up. We, be, we mature. Um, and in that sense... Uh, we are different from the animal world. We have a moral awareness, whereas to a large extent the animal world has no moral awareness, uh, moral perfection, uh, creativity, social relationships. And again, some of that is reflected in the animal world, but not in the same way that humans can do those things. God created humankind upright, perfect, um, without sin. Not perfect as God is perfect, and, and perhaps I should say it at, at this particular point that even in heaven one day, although we say that we will then live in perfection, it will be a world as perfect as God intended it to be. But only God is perfect. So even in heaven one day, we will not be perfect, perfect. We will never be as perfect as God. Um, and so we need to understand that, um, that, that we have a, a, an, an uprightness or an up, a righteousness uh, we, we were created without sin, but we weren't perfect right at the beginning. Adam, or mankind, was given lordship over the earth to subdue it. Uh, he walked or uh, communed with God and therefore had some kind of a fellowship and was in harmony with God. And initially, Adam knew no sin, although he was capable of sin. And we need to make that distinction as well. He had no sin, but he, he had the capability uh, to sin as can be seen from the fact that he was given a command. Otherwise, he, if he had no capability of sinning, the, the command would make no sense whatsoever. And therefore, God put the command there, and that ultimately became a test and also the downfall for mankind. A quick little word about the image of God in humankind in general. In other words, uh, do sinners and people who, who don't know Jesus, do they have the image of God in them? Ultimately and essentially the answer is yes. It is a distorted image, but they still have the image of God. Because if we define the image of God as knowledge and moral awareness and the ability to socialize and to, to establish relationships, to grow, to grow in knowledge and so on, then that is the, those characteristics are shared uh, with the rest of humanity, with every single person out there in creation uh, shares that same um, image or characteristics. Um, the, the very fact that people out there can write books that are helpful generally to everybody, the very fact that people are creative, that they, that they discover uh, through scientific means or uh, through whatever other means, that they grow in knowledge, all of those things mean that they reflect the image of God because those are some of the characteristics of the image of God. However, only Jesus Christ ultimately is perfect. And only Jesus is the full and perfect image of God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 is very important in this regard. Jesus is the full image, the full reflection of God. And so Jesus is the full perfect uh, with no, no uh, sin or anything in him. He is the full reflection of God. And he's the only one who therefore can restore the image of God in us. Uh, one step ahead of myself, but uh, if you look at the image of God in Genesis 1 and 2, that was marred or disturbed, uh, muddied in chapter 3. And then 
from that point on, God is in the business of restoring the image of God. And, and if you fast forward the picture and the story to the New Testament, Jesus came into this world, the Son of God, in order to die, take upon himself the sins of the world, to bring us into that fellowship relationship with God. And we are living, and this is a concept that I, that I will get back to uh, again and again. We are living in an intermediate phase where we have everything that God intended us to have. That is the already. But we don't have it yet in its fullness. That is when we will get to heaven one day. So we're living in between. We're living in a tension almost. We have it and we don't have it. Uh, theologians refer to that as the already and the not yet. Um, so Jesus came to restore the image of God. So the Christian, the, in the Christian's life, uh, the image of God has been restored. But the full restoration work will only happen uh, when we get to heaven one day. Right, mankind created male and female. From the creation story you learn that there are two genders. They are equal um, in dignity, they are equal in value, equal in status. Both are created in the image of God. Both are human beings, humanity, and both of them um, share the same species. Uh, Adam said, uh, this is bone, or in that particular case, he switches, uh, or the language switches from Adam to Ish, which is male, uh, and he said uh, uh, her, her name will be Isha, which is the feminine version uh, of that word uh, Ish, show, so, show. So Ish and Isha, uh, the, that's male and female. But he essentially said, this is bone of my bone. When you looked at the rest of creation, uh, the animal world, he didn't find anybody that could be, um, could be that helpmate for him. But he found that in Eve because God created her for that particular purpose. They have complementary roles, and that's the way I read Genesis chapter 1. The words, the Hebrew words, both Adam and Ish referring to man. And as I said to you, Adam can refer to humanity in general, but it can also mean a man. Uh, have female versions, and that is Adama and Isha. And so both of the words have the same root, uh, and therefore it reflects the fact that they come from the same species. The words suitable helper mean that they fulfill each other. They are opposite and opposites, and yet they are complementary. Together uh, they make a unit. And the biological differences are clear when the human body is even just casually observed. Nobody it needs to be a rocket scientist uh, to tell you uh, that, that men and women uh, differ from each other. And yet they are complementary uh, and working together. Some of our responsibilities include that we need to live for the glory of God. In other words, we need to reflect the image of God. If I have been created in the image of God, I must therefore reflect the image of God. Now, as a Christian, my, the, I was born with sin and I have sinned, actively sinned against God, and therefore I'm lost, I've rebelled against God, I deserved God's punishment, but Jesus came to restore that image. Now as a Christian, and I can preach a sermon on this, uh, the importance for us uh, to live for the glory of God, to reflect the image of God, and therefore to spend more and more and more time in the Word of God to find out what it is that God wants us to do, how we should live in this world, so that we can reflect the image of God properly. Man must rule over God's creation. In other words, take care of the physical world. We looked at this last week. And man should also help to restore God's image in mankind as God intended it to be. In the New Testament terms, we refer to evangelism or mission. We are on a mission. And um, if we get to uh, the second last lecture, we will be looking at the church's mission. And, and, and these things that we talk about are all very closely interrelated and interlocked. You cannot understand Christian missions or the mission of God from a New Testament perspective unless you go all the way back to God, God's creation, God's revelation, sin, and God's restoration. And so unless you understand that picture, then this whole, co this whole concept of uh, going back into this world and being on a mission for God those things will make no sense whatsoever unless you're able to connect them all. Just another concept that I want to introduce you to is, um, and you may have wondered about this, and this is the, the unity of the human being. Uh, who are we? Uh, theologians have 
for years discussed and debated uh, whether the human is made up of body, soul, and spirit, uh, commonly referred to as a trichotomy view, or whether it's only body on the one hand and soul, spirit on the other. Uh, it's called the dichotomous view. But this question was debated for years, and, and, and nowadays most theologians don't spend a huge amount of time on that particular issue. Um, understanding that the emphasis really is on unity, the unity of the human being. Interestingly enough, Jesus came into this world. He was born with a body, with a human body. He grew up, became a, human be a man, a grown man. He died on the cross. When he rose again, he rose with a body. It was a glorified body. And oftentimes theologians will refer to Jesus ascending to heaven. Physically, the disciples were able to see him uh, going with his body. Now, it's a different kind of body. This kind of body now, he was able to go through walls. The doors were locked when he appeared to the disciples after his resurrection. But it was a body nonetheless. And even when Thomas and others sort of doubted, Jesus said, come, feel, come touch me. It's not, a, it's not some kind of a ghees or a spook or a something. Uh, this, this is a real person. I am here standing before you. And so in that sense, Jesus took on a body. Um, and, and how that will look like and what it will look like ultimately in heaven is another question. It's also another big debate and a question, but um, there is no doubt in my mind that when we get to heaven, we will be recognizable. In other words, I would be able to identify you. Uh, lots of questions around that and how it will look and, and, and pan out eventually, but it looks like we will be able to recognize uh, each other in heaven. Now, that's just the unity of the body. So whether we talk, whether you believe that we're made up of body, soul, and spirit, or body and, and some kind of spiritual side to us, uh, there's no doubt that we have the, at least those two. Uh, and then, as I said, some believe that it's made up of three different parts. Uh, one way or the other, I don't think it makes makes a huge amount of difference. Some of the common errors in the uh, uh, belief about or the study of anthropology, humans are simply highly evolved animals. We looked at the, the teachings of evolution last week briefly. Um, there, there is no doubt in my mind that the Bible teaches that God created mankind in His image. And therefore, it is not just uh, a millions of years sort of evolving into ultimately becoming the image of God. I believe God created human beings. Whenever that happened, He created human beings and He created them in His own image. And so in that sense, you can't be a total or a complete evolutionist. Only Christians have the image of God. Now, I've already answered this particular question, and, and that is uh, a belief that uh, it's only when you become a Christian that you really have the image of God. Now, what is true is that Jesus came to restore the image of God. But the image of God is present in every single human being in, on earth. Um, and I've already spoken about that. It's a broken image. Uh, it's, not, it's not a perfect image of God, but it's, it's, it's a, a, the image of God nonetheless. And then Christians can't sin because Christ restored in them the image of God is another false doctrine or a false belief. Um, the Bible is very clear, the New Testament is clear that Christians sin, unfortunately. I wish it was true that once we become Christians, we will never sin again. But all of us here know that we sin, and the Bible is clear that we do sin, but we do have someone, Jesus, who is our Redeemer and also our intercessor with God. And when we do sin, then Jesus is able to uh, represent us with God. Now, that leads us to the whole concept of sin. And the big word here is hamartiology. And the word hamartio means to sin. And so the study of sin uh, is often referred to in theological terms as hamartiology. hamartiology. Genesis 3 is the picture that I've already um, begun to paint a little bit uh, in the past. As beautiful as that picture was, God created the whole universe, then He rested. Uh, this story is retold how He created, expanded upon. Uh, human beings are created, Adam and Eve. They're in the Garden of Eden. They are happy. Uh, they're in communion with one another, with God, with creation. It's, it really is a wonderful picture. But as beautiful as that picture is, 
Genesis 3 introduces us to the fall of humanity into sin. Before the fall of Adam and Eve, um, a representative of humanity to come, they lived in perfect conditions in Eden and in perfect harmony with creation, with God and their Creator. But when they succumbed to the temptation and they fell into sin, they introduced and represented the problem that is the assumed reality throughout the rest of the Bible. So you, you can't understand anything beyond Genesis 3 unless you understand Genesis 3. Genesis 3 says that sin entered into this world. From that point on, the rest of the Bible story is about this. Sin, rebellion against God, God pursuing humanity, and God providing salvation. And so even as we continue our journey, we talk about Jesus, we talk about the church, we talk about the Holy Spirit in the next few weeks. This is the assumed reality in the Bible, and that is there is sin. The biblical picture is a perfect one. Uh, in two chapters, the rest of the Bible is um, the one about the fall and the reality of living in a fallen reality. It's God, by His grace, therefore, reaching out into this world. Um, and I use the word to fix the problem. The problem is sin. And God has pursued us and continues uh, to pursue us uh, to fix this problem of sin. In the Old Testament, it refers to a future reality when God will finally and fully restore everything. Again and again, the Old Testament refers to that. As far back as, as Abraham, who will be a blessing to the nations. Moses, who talked about a prophet like me, whom God will raise up. The seed of David. And, the, and then the prophets, again and again, talking about some future reality where people will be in harmony with God, where the heart of stone will be removed. It will be replaced by a heart of flesh, where true circumcision will not be an outward act, but, but an inward um, reality. Uh, all of those things refer to God dealing with, uh, with sin, the temptation, the fallenness of humanity, and how that will be restored. Now, all of that happened in Jesus. Gee, when Jesus came, He did it in perfect conditions. He was the perfect priest and sacrifice, bringing us into a relationship with God once again. The Bible story then ends with the book of Revelation, which again is a bit of a, a reach into the future. It tells the story. It tells salvation, the salvation story. But it reaches into the future. And it paints a picture of a future reality where heaven and earth will combine. There will be a new earth and a new heaven. And God will dwell among us. And there will be perfect harmony. And if you wish, God will then come again in the cool of the day and He will be with His people uh, because there's now complete restoration and there's complete harmony. Right now we live in this intermediate period between, between the reality of sin in this world and, and uh, the desire to be in perfect conditions with God, to live in Eden, the Garden of Eden. And it's interesting when you read the book of Revelation how many Old Testament images are referred to in that book. Uh, not, not the least important the fact that it reaches back to the Garden of Eden picture of God being present. There is no temple. There's no need for a temple. There's no need for sacrifices because it is a perfect uh, place. It is a perf those are perfect conditions and God is there communing with His own people. And the nature of sin. The Bible uses different words for sin. The literal translations uh, sometimes give us a bit of an idea uh, it, it talks about missing the mark is one of the translations for the word to sin or simply erring against God or erring uh, is another definition of sin. Uh, act of rebellion or going astray, trespassing, transgressions, uh, twisting is another possible translation for the word sin. It's taking the truth and twisting it. Um, it it's exactly what the devil did. He, uh, and oftentimes that's exactly what the devil does. And when we look at some of the false teachings, more often than not, a false teaching is not directly opposed to the gospel. It's taking a truth of the word of God or of the, of the things that we believe and twisting it into looking just slightly off color. Uh, and, and eventually you end up far away from God, but that's exactly what sin does. Unrighteousness, injustice, godlessness. These are all concepts that we find in the Bible. Everything, every one of those words referring to sin. 
Sin is directed against God, um, who by, by His very nature is good, He is righteous. We looked at that two weeks ago. He revealed His moral will to us. Uh, in other words, how we should be living and how we should be, uh, should be behaving. But sin is therefore not just a small little misunderstanding. It's not a little oops. Sin is radically going against God. And, and as I said to you um, in a little bit of my testimony, that's, that's a concept that I needed to come to grips with. And that is, I haven't just stepped slightly out of line and therefore I just need to be corrected a little bit. I have been a sinner lost in my sinfulness. And, and that's where I was. Uh, if it wasn't for the grace of God coming to me in and, G, in and through Jesus Christ, uh, I would not have been saved. And therefore, sin needs God's intervention. The concept of original sin is something that many people grapple and battle with. But since Adam's sin, all human beings are born in sin. Uh, you, you will find that concept throughout the scriptures. I refer to Psalm 14, verse 1, Romans 5, 12 to 19, 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, in every one of those passages, you will find a clear reference to the fact that hum, human beings are born in sin. Uh, it is part of our makeup when we come into this world. Now, it doesn't look like that, that when you look at a little baby. Um, I, I just recently, uh, friends had, had a baby and we were able to play a little bit grandparents for them. And, uh, and just holding that little baby, you, you, can't, you can't identify sin with this newborn baby. It, it is almost impossible to bring the two together. And yet it is a very strong statement in the Bible. Original sin in the singular results in human beings acting upon their sin. And therefore, sins in the plural become part of what we are. Uh, even as Christians, it's interesting in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, a verse that we know very well. Uh, if we confess our sins in the plural, He is righteous and will forgive us, uh, by way of a, a summary of that verse. And, and it's interesting that because of our nature that is sinful, we therefore commit sins in the plural. It doesn't take long for a new baby, that same very brand new baby that I'm talking about, newborn baby, it doesn't take long, uh, a year, two years, three years, and naturally, by instinct almost, they start um, uh, doubting, telling lies. Um, no, nobody taught them how to do those things because they're beginning to act upon their sinful nature, which is part of what we call original sin. Jesus came to deal with original sin. So when he died, he, he died for the original sin. So potentially, when people accept Jesus, when, when, when they become Christians, their original sin before God, my guilt before God, is taken away. I still have a, a sinful nature battling with my spiritual, my God-given Christian nature, says Paul in Romans chapter 6 uh, and 7. And, and the two are battling with each other. So I constantly have these uh, uh, doubts and problems and issues that I deal with sin in my life. And I constantly need to go and ask for, uh, for forgiveness. What is the extent of sin? Well, the introduction of sin affected the whole human race and it still affects every single human being. Christian, mature Christian, a long-standing Christian, doesn't matter. Every single one of us deals with sin on a regular basis. And the effects are universal. There is no escape. Every person out there in the whole world. We are not born um, as clean slates and we live somewhere. And if nobody bothers us, we will eventually just be okay. Don't worry about us, sort of thing. It doesn't work that way. We are born in sin and we are affected by sin. Sin also affects every part of our human being. Um, our very existence, our intellect, our emotions, our motives, hearts, actions. And theologians refer to this as total depravity. I am totally depraved of God's image and God's glory. Every part of me, my, my whole psyche, my whole human being, every part of me is affected by sin. Uh, we are totally depraved. Sin affected the rest of creation. We live in a fallen reality. Uh, goes back to Genesis chapter 3. Blaming one another. Uh, no longer in harmony with nature. And now we're going to work in sweat. Uh, we will have children in pain. And, and so it goes on and on. Every part of humanity has been affected. The whole of creation has been affected. Some of the consequences of sin 
are clear. Sin and sinfulness result in a disturbed relationship with God. That's where it starts. Um, I, I don't know God. I don't want to know God. I feel guilty and therefore I, I turn away from God. Um, there's enmity and, and rebel, rebellion against God. We have an inability to do God's will by nature because by nature we are sinners. It's a disturbed relationship with our neighbor. Hence the command, love your neighbor. But we have a problem with our neighbor. And our neighbor may, may be my wife, my children, and, and physically the person living next to me or any other enemy out there. And guilt feelings within ourselves. So it affects my self-image really. And so often I have done counseling with people and they just have such a low, low, low self-image because it's a result of sin. Helping them understand that God accepted uh, us, that God created us in His image, God has forgiven us. All of those things where, where Jesus came to restore it all, it brings us back to God, it brings us in harmony with our neighbor, love your neighbor, it brings us actually in harmony with ourselves, accepting that God has created me who I am and I'm forgiven. If sin is not dealt with, if sin is not atoned for, in other words, the ultimate result is death and destruction. Hell and eternal damnation. Um, that's a topic we don't necessarily like talking about, but the Bible is full of it. Uh, and Jesus talked about that, and that's a reality. People are not atoned. If sin is not atoned for and people don't find God, then ultimately they will end up in hell. Some of the debates among Christians include several things. What happens to babies when they die? Now, after the tea break, I'll come back to this particular issue and just uh, touch on some of these uh, once again. What, what is the unpardonable sin? I, I've had people in my office saying, I, I'm, I'm convinced that I've, I've um, committed the unpardonable sin. So what is that? And, and I'll, I'll come back to that as well. And then how much freedom do we have as human beings? If, are, we, are we simply just condemned to sin? Uh, do I have any freedom, uh, any choice in the matter of sin, or don't I have any freedom in this regard? I'll, I'll just answer that particular one. It seems when you read Genesis 3, 2 and 3, that God gave Adam and Eve the choice. And it seems like when they sin, they're not just totally condemned to sin. God knew in his foreknowledge that that's the route they're going to take. But uh, they, they have the freedom to say no to sin. And oftentimes, even Christians will come and say, I, I just don't have any control over this. I, when I see myself, I sin again. Well, at the end of the day, somewhere along the line, one's going to take control of those desires because in Christ, it is possible to have victory uh, over sin, uh, particular sins. Uh, we will never be without sin, but particular sins we can overcome and have victory over them. I'll come back to that, but I think we need to take a bit of a tea break now, and then uh, we'll chat about some of these debates again. Right. Um, trust you had a good break, and uh, we need to come back to those questions. What happens to babies when they die? Well, it's a, it's a forever debate. And um, it's a debate out there, um, and it can be a theoretical debate until your own baby dies, or you're a pastor and you need to help and console people who have just lost a baby. And uh, those are very, very difficult issues. And uh, we don't have time to go into all of the details, but essentially I believe that Jesus, when he died, he died for original sin to cover original sin. And by God's grace and only by God's knowledge, He will deal with those babies the way He does. Now, if people push me on a, on a real answer, then my ultimate answer would be that those babies go to heaven because they haven't had an opportunity to act upon their original sin. In other words, they don't have sins in the plural, but they are born with sin. But they can only be saved if they are saved by God's grace through Jesus Christ. So that's the only basis of salvation. Um, it sounds a bit unfair because um, another logical conclusion to that argument would be, well, it may be better just to kill all the babies when they are born because then everybody goes to heaven. Um, that would be a bad argument, though, uh, because that means that someone around needs to kill them and that person will be guilty and, and would continue to sin. Anyway, you can see the difficulty of some of those kinds of debates. Unpardonable sin. Uh, many Christians struggle with this issue. Uh, I've committed a gross thing against God, and then they come for counseling, and they would say,
to the counselor, the pastor, whoever, I, I'm convinced that I have uh, committed the unpardonable sin. My first response in a case like that is, the fact that you are sitting here and you're talking to me means you haven't. Because if you have committed the unpardonable sin, you will deny Jesus. You won't have any guilt about it. You won't even wonder whether I have committed the unpardonable sin. Because the unpardonable sin is rejecting Jesus. And that's what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees rejected Jesus. They didn't feel guilty about it. Eventually, they handed him over to Pilate to let him uh, be crucified and die. So, the fact that you wonder whether you have committed the unpardonable sin means the Holy Spirit is at work in your heart. And denying the Holy Spirit is what Jesus said. If you deny the Holy Spirit, then... Uh, or ascribe the work of the Holy Spirit to the devil is the, the exact context where Jesus makes that uh, statement. Uh, then you won't even know it, and you would think you're doing God a favor uh, by doing all of that, and you will never feel guilty. So the fact that you have some sense of guilt means that the Holy Spirit is still at work in your life. And therefore, what you need to do is confess the sin, whatever the sin is. There is no sin bit too big for God to forgive. That is also a biblical concept. And so the unpardonable sin is when you have gone so far that you don't wonder about God, you don't even want God in your life, you're denying the Holy Spirit, reject the Holy Spirit, uh, and, and, and everything else with that. And, and that is unpardonable because you, you have no repentance. But the one unchanging fact in the Bible is when sinners repent, God forgives. That's, that's unchanging in the Bible. And so those are some of the debates among Christians. And uh, as I said, we don't have time to go into more detail. But some of the errors related to the doctrine around sin or harmatiology. One is that people are born without sin and they only sin later on. Um, the Bible teaches very clearly that humans are born in sin. And uh, I have tried to show that to you. Christ restores the image of God is another view. Uh, and, and once he does that, he takes away my ability to sin. Now, there's several versions of this particular view. And that is, now that I'm a Christian, I don't sin. Some versions of this me says that I become a Christian, my sins are forgiven, and then a little bit later on, somewhere in my journey, the root of sin is taken out. It's, it's very typical of the holiness movement. And then the, the root of sin is actually taken out of my life. Uh, I, don't, I actually personally don't want to be part of a movement like that because I know myself and, and I know how I struggle with sin from time to time. Um, and the Bible is very clear that even Christians continue to sin. But when we do, we know what to do with that. We know that we can go to God and that Christ is our Redeemer and our intercessor and that He will intercede for us, but we need to confess and we need to repent uh, of our sin. And every time I do, then God will forgive our sins. I just want to give you a little picture of how distorted truth can become. It's called the Family International um, now, and they used to have the name uh, the Children of God. It started as a hippie movement under a, a man by the name of David Burke, who became a relatively old, older gentleman, a typical hippie with long hair, beard. Uh, it, it's part of that whole 60, 70 freedom movement. We free, we free, and um, it resulted in all sorts of different movements, movements around the world at that particular time. But the, it, it, it coincided with people who had a heart for hippies and then reached out to these people, flower people, you know, walking bare feet and uh, just, just free sex and, and everything is free. We don't want to be bound by all the rules and the ru regulations of this world. And uh, that was typical of the hippie movement. And so many people reached out to them uh, with the gospel. And so the Jesus movement started as part of the, uh, the hippie movement. And some people became Christians. Now, you can read up all of, of that. And there are many different versions of that. Uh, some lasted just for a while. They came back mainstream society again, etc., uh, etc. Et but David Burke became a Christian. And then uh, didn't actually deny everything that was going on in the hippie movement at that particular time. This whole concept of free sex, for example, and, and what you have in your notes and what I'm, what I'm quoting is actually quotes from, uh, from a website, and, and, and you, can, you can look at this, and Wikipedia and several others will, will have it on. If you Google David Burke, you will come up with uh, even the statements of faith and everything else. 
but adult members may have sex with any other adult member of the opposite sex and are encouraged to do so, regardless of marital status, as a way to foster unity and combat loneliness of those in need. And this is commonly called sharing or sacrificial sex. Um, and we are talking about a, a so-called Christian church movement here. So this is not a, a way out in you know, the world, uh, Hindu or whatever other religion. We're talking about people who call themselves Christians. It goes one step further. In 1974, David Burke introduced a new proselytization method called flirty fishing, or FFing for short, which encouraged female members to show God's love by engaging in sexual activity with potential converts. By 1978, it was widely practiced by members of the group. According to the Family International, as a result of flirty fishing, over 100,000. I read on a website just today that they claim that more than 223,000 people came to know the Lord through sexual activity. In other words, these were girls and women who were out there evangelizing the world by offering their bodies to have sex so that they can then share the gospel with them so that they can then become Christians. Um, so this is how distorted it can become. And, and I want to say to you again, we're not going to study other religions in this particular course. I wish we had more time to look at other religions. We're not here talking about other religions. We're talking about distortions of the Christian faith. And I, I will show to you over time more and more of this kind of example. It may be a, a fairly radical example, but the reality is, and this I want to say to you, that a year, two years ago, a year and a half ago, a young girl started coming to our church, and she came out of this movement. She was drawn into this movement with a, a little pamphlet that was given to her at a shopping mall right here in Johannesburg. And um, she was drawn to it because this is not what they tell you when, when they start. The, their statement of faith is probably 95% like any other churches. And there's one clause, and it is part of their statement of faith. They have now left the flirty fishing thing. They, they stopped that in the, I think, late 80s. They no longer do that. Uh, so they no longer promote that. But they're still around. They're still international. And so they're operating right here in South Africa. But they do encourage people to get release of their frustrations and emotions by having sex with different partners around within the movement. And, and she left the movement when, when that came to light. And uh, obviously something just hit her in the face. But it wasn't initially the way they promoted themselves. It was simply a pamphlet, and she started attending. And then ultimately, uh, when this thing came to light, then she, she um, had a big fright, and she left uh, the group and started coming to us. But I actually saw the pamphlet, and then I went online and looked up their statement of faith. As I said to you, if you read it, 95% we're in agreement. It's that 5% that results in stuff uh, like this. Okay, that is um, humanity and humanity in sin. So we've looked at anthropology, biblical anthropology. We've looked at hamartiology. Now we're going to uh, just change focus slightly as we look at the spiritual world. It's a, it's a concept that is probably uh, a question mark in our minds. How does it all work? Uh, we talk about the study of angelology, the study of angels, or demonology. Uh, which is the study of, of demons or the devil. Spiritual beings in Scripture are a reality. They, they simply assume. Uh, there's no description of this is how God made them and this is how the things developed in the spiritual world. In fact, it is a world, if I can put it this way, out there that is beyond our physical touch uh, and our ability to see physically and to be physically part uh, of that. Although it is a reality that is around us, it is not something that is tangible uh, to us. But God's creation is not limited to the physical world. Up to this point in time, my illustrations have always been uh, the, the mountain and the ocean and the human body. And, you know, it's mostly tangible things because that's the world that we live in uh, on a day to day basis. But there is a, there is a, a non physical realm, a spiritual realm out there that we are all aware of, but we don't live with that reality every single day. Not, we, we don't think about that necessarily every day. But the many, many references in the Bible, uh, too many to enumerate over here, but references to the spiritual world and spiritual beings such as angels, spirits, 
uh, even spirit in the, in the singular sometimes. Cherubim or seraphim we read about uh, in several places such as Isaiah 6, for example. The sons of God, um, powers, thrones, principalities, demons. Uh, all of those words in the Bible refer to a spiritual world, a spiritual reality out there that is non-tangible to us for the most part. Some of these beings have names uh, in the Bible. Gabriel um, is an angel. Michael is another name we find for an angel in the Bible. But then the word Satan or Satan uh, or devil, those words are also used um, in the Bible for spiritual beings, and he is an evil spiritual being. There is an article that was written by J. Hampton Keithley III, um, which I found extremely helpful in this regard, and there are many other books as well. But here's just a short quote, and you can access this on uh, Bible.org, uh, on that website, Bible.org. Angels are spiritual beings created by God to serve Him, though created higher than man. Some, the good angels, have remained obedient to God, to Him, and carry out His will, while others, fallen angels, disobeyed, fell fell from their holy position, and now stand in active opposition to the work and the plan of God. Now, that already gives you a little glimpse into the evil side of the spiritual world. Both created by God, but not created evil, but created good. So, all of God creation is good. Part of God's spiritual world creation uh, disobeyed and went off and therefore are now in opposition with God. And I, I do encourage you to go online and, and look for this article and read the whole article because it really is a, it gives a good perspective on uh, this particular uh, story or this particular subject. When it comes to angels, um, there is much speculation among Christians and non-Christians, by the way. Uh, I found it very interesting. Uh, for the last few years, there's been almost a, a, a reliving of of angels and people are all plucked up about angels and the angels out there and how they look after us and they have little angels and angels in the car and uh, they read about angels and so on. Some people half worship angels and there's a bit of a, a, a spiritual side to the new age movement as well which has a lot to say about this kind of spiritual uh, reality. Um, but when we look at the Bible and and again, it's very limited, and we're going to just scratch the surface. There's a lot more. Billy Graham, for example, wrote a book just on the topic of angels staying with the Scriptures, staying in the Bible. And, and that is a, a really good work to, to go and look up. I don't refer to that elsewhere. Um, but to, to, to find that particular resource and just read from a biblical perspective what is said about angels, because it's a real spiritual, real world out there uh, that we don't often realize. But they were created by God. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 6 uh, refers to that. They are spiritual beings. In other words, they are without a body. Although at times they appear to human beings in bodily form. Um, some people, some Christians and other people, sometimes claim that they have seen an angel. But what they normally refer to, we have a friend uh, who got stuck on an airport once and someone came and helped her. Um, and, and put her up in a hotel even for, for a night and so on, uh, paid and, and then disappeared. Uh, disappeared as in whether she was too tired to see where the person went uh, or whether it was an angel. I mean, she still today claims it was a real angel. Whether that's true or not, um, you know, who will know? Uh, oftentimes, uh, those angels appeared and they, they looked like human beings. Abraham saw three human beings, three people walking towards him towards uh, his, his home. He went out, greeted them, put some food before them. As time progresses, as the story continues, they turn out to be angels, and one of them actually turns out to be God. And, and so it is possible for an angel to appear in a, in a bodily form, but then there are times where they just disappear like that. Uh, some of the announcements about birth, for example, in Mary's case and so on. She clearly saw an angel. She knew bright light and everything else. Other times it's a very normal human type looking situation. Um, and whether that's an angel or not, um, nowadays we won't, probably won't know. But they are uh, God's warriors and often referred to as God's heavenly host. Um, and 
God, Jesus, for example, could have called millions of angels to come and help and fight this war uh, if he wanted to. We get the, the impression that angels are waiting and they are ready to serve God uh, any moment and every moment of every day, uh, if they even have days uh, where they are. Uh, they are servants of God by doing God's will. They, they serve human beings. In other words, they serve God's creation. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14. They have moral judgment and intelligence. They have the ability to sin. Otherwise, if we don't believe that, we're in trouble with where the evil spiritual world came from. So God created everything good, but some part of that spiritual world, world fell into disobedience uh, and now opposed God. And Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4 says exactly that, and that the uh, spiritual or the angels sinned against God. Uh, there seems to be some form of order or rank uh, among them. Michael is referred to as an archangel. Whatever that means, in terms of the economy of the spiritual world, we probably won't be able to figure out exactly anymore. The opposite to angels, uh, we find the demons. Demons are evil angels who sinned against God and now continually work evil in the world, says Grudem in the little booklet that, that we are using. Uh, and there's a lot more, in, in not only in that booklet, but in the other books written uh, on theology about the, the demon world. They were part of God's original creation, which was very good. Quoting uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 33, we have to take that as God, everything in God's creation was good. But they fell into sin. Jude, verse 6, refers to the angels who fell into sin. And, and that is um, a, a similar reference to that what we find in Second Peter. And that must have happened before the fall of mankind. In other words, before Genesis chapter 3. Where, when, uh, beyond time, before time, before light and darkness and day and night was created, uh, it must have happened somewhere in eternity, uh, the point of which we can no longer uh, determine. But we know that because it is the devil taking on the form of a serpent uh, who came and tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. How and when they rebelled against God, uh, we no longer know. Satan. Satan is the personal name for the head of the demons, again quoting Grudem in this regard. He is also referred to the devil, uh, Satan, as the devil. He is called the serpent, uh, or takes on the form of a serpent in Genesis 3. He is called Beelzebul. Uh, the prince of this world in John chapter 12, verse 31, the ruler of the kingdom of the air in Ephesians 2, verse 2, and, and simply the evil one in Matthew chapter 13, verse 19. In the Bible, he's known as a murderer. He is the father of, the lie, of lies, says Jesus. He sinned from the beginning. Uh, he is the deceiver. He is the great accuser of the saints. We find him in, uh, in Zechariah accusing Joshua the priest before God. He appears before God. Now, that's a comfort to me uh, because he's accountable to God. He's not just out there running uh, on his own without God being able to control him. But even in Revelation, he is called the, the accuser of the brothers. And so he is there to accuse us before God. Um, in terms of, of, of our experience, the way we normally refer to that is uh, in the sense of spiritual warfare. We are in a battle, says Paul in Ephesians chapter 6. Non-Christians are blinded by Satan. Uh, they have little or no knowledge of God, and the devil certainly intends to keep it that way, which is why we are in a battle. When you do missionary work or evangelism or you share the gospel, the light of Jesus Christ with another person, immediately you engage in spiritual battle. It's immediately a battle between light and darkness, um, which is why oftentimes you share the gospel and you're up against a wall, a brick wall in front of you. Uh, and, and people just don't see. Paul expressed his almost frustration with his own people, the Jews, because they, they weren't able to see. They, had, they were veiled. It's like, like they were just blinded. It's, it, I mean, how can you not see that Jesus is the Messiah sort of argument? And yet they can't. And somehow it seems like the devil is able to keep this veil over their eyes, to keep them blind so that they don't ultimately see God and see Jesus. Christians, uh, that's the world out there. 
But Christians also engage in a battle. I, I already referred to that when we share the gospel purely. I mean, uh, when, when simply I share the gospel with another person, there's a spiritual battle going on. Because there's a, it's a battle for dominion, uh, a battle for allegiance, uh, where a person who doesn't know Christ is uh, uh, serving, serving the devil, whether they like it or not. Now, there is an extreme version of that, and I'll come back to that later on, but that is Satanism, where people say, I believe in Satan, I believe he is God, and I want to serve Satan, and therefore I'm going to do sacrifices and going through rituals and everything else. Uh, Satan is my head or my boss. Now, that's the extreme version of that. But my good neighbor, uh, good-looking and well-behaved neighbor, who simply lives his life with no, no thought to God or Christ or anything, but he doesn't serve Satan either. Um, my, my good neighbor actually is under that allegiance. He is, he is serving Satan somehow or the other because he doesn't belong to God. And in that sense, and, and this is a quote from, from 1 John or summarizing 1 John, there is there's only black or white. There is only either you belong to the devil or you belong to Christ. There is no neutral ground somewhere in between. And that's another lie of the devil, is that there's neutral ground. You know, some people are just okay. We just need to leave them alone. And, and somehow God will just help them and they will all be okay in the end. Actually, they're not okay. If they don't know Christ, they belong to the devil, to the dominion of darkness. The, the Bible is clear. The picture in the Bible is clear that uh, we belonged to the dominion of the darkness. And by God's grace, he took us out of darkness into his marvelous light is the quote. Christians, says Paul, fight this battle. Ephesians chapter 6 is one of the probably most well-known uh, passages when it comes to spiritual warfare. And, and he says it's a spiritual battle. Uh, Satan's intention is to mislead, to tempt, to entice Christians to sin against God. And every time I sin, uh, it is somehow falling to the exact temptation that Eve faced, and that is doubt. Um, lying, uh, hiding, and, uh, and rebellion uh, against God. All of those terms that we used before. There's much debate and also practice among Christians as to how spiritual warfare should happen. And, and now Christians go in all sorts of directions uh, when it comes to to what extent do people... Um, fight this de de demon world, uh, and, and when it comes to demonology especially, uh, to what extent are people possessed by the devil and the driving out of demons, which is what Jesus did and some of the apostles did, and the church has been doing uh, through for 2,000 years, but to what extent do we engage in that? And, and, and um, to what extent can Christians be possessed by the devil? And the debates around that go on, and the practices around that also go on, and on. The most important thing to remember is that as Christians we belong to God and we are serving Jesus Christ. And it is in Jesus that we have victory. And so my normal philosophy is I don't go and look for the devil ever. He will look for me. He will find me. I don't have to go and look for him. So even in, in ministry, which I do full time, I, I don't go and look for where and how or, or when a person may be demon possessed. It, it will reveal itself. I don't have to go even look for it. And so therefore, I, I serve Christ. And what I do, I serve Christ as my Lord. But to use the analogy, I also serve Christ to other people. Um, and so in that sense, that's all I want to do. And if there is a demon, and if there is any satanic or de demon, demonic activity in the other person, it will come out. It will show itself. In which case, the only thing that I can do is run to Jesus. Because Jesus conquered the devil. That I know for sure. In fact, it's not even an equal battle. We know that the devil has been defeated. And therefore, it's not a, this, this battle between darkness and light is not an equal battle. The light has already conquered. Uh, God is already the victor. Jesus already conquered the devil. And, and so he's, a, he's fighting a losing battle, but he's fighting nonetheless. Jesus came to break the power of darkness and to restore us uh, uh, in us the image of God. I've already referred to some of the debates, but just to put it uh, in more succinct language, to what extent can Christians be influenced or possessed by the devil or by demons? Some Christians distinguish between 
being oppressed by the devil or by demons and being possessed by demons. Now, the argument is theologically speaking and biblically speaking, it is impossible to be possessed by God and others to be indwelled by Jesus and the Holy Spirit and at the same time to be indwelled by the devil. You, you can't have two masters in your life. The reality is that the devil can, can, can creep in in certain areas of your life. There may be a crack. Sin is normally the handle that the devil will use to try and enter into your life. If he can entice you, tempt you, and you fall, then he's got a finger that is poking in your eye uh, sort of thing. And, and that, in my personal opinion, would be perhaps... The furthest that I would go is to say that a person in a particular area of his or her life can be oppressed. There's some kind of demonic oppression. It may be for historical reasons. It may be for whatever other reasons. I don't know. There's a lot of debate and, 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 and different methodologies in going about in terms of dealing with any sort of demonic activity in a person's life. And I've seen it. I personally uh, had some exposure to that and even had to minister in, in those kind of realms. Uh, it, as I said to you, it's not the kind of thing that I would ever look for. Um, I, I just believe I positively share Jesus with other people and, and help them to understand. And So that's a debate, and I'm sure that you have been exposed to some of that debate as well. Can a Christian be demon-possessed? My answer is no. Uh, I don't think, I don't believe a Christian can be demon-possessed. You can only be possessed by Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. Um, there may be uh, a temptation or uh, an oppression in a part of your life, which is obviously, if it's sin, it ultimately goes back to the devil and who the devil is. Can I blame the devil for my sin? The devil made me do it. Well, it's, the answer to that is yes and no. It's yes in the sense that ultimately any sin can be attributed to the devil. But I can't just uh, play the game that, you know, I'm, I'm not guilty. I didn't do anything. The devil made me do it. Um, I mean, it, it sounds familiar with one of our very famous cricket players, doesn't it? Um, but, but if I have a desire and a problem for money or uh, sexual sin or whatever other sin it may be in my life, uh, ultimately I need to, under God and under Christ's reign, I need to take control of that particular, particular area and therefore say no to the devil's temptation. Uh, it's not the devil. I, you know, it's not like he's taking my hand and he makes me steal stuff. Uh, I, I'm stealing it. I need to own up to whatever sin I'm committing. And so in that sense, the answer is no. Not the devil who made me do it, but ultimately sin can be attributed to the devil. What are some of the dangers that we need to avoid? Extreme views is one thing that I want to highlight as a danger in this particular area. Whether we talk about angels or demons, we talk about the spiritual world. Um, we can deny the spiritual world and say, no, no, it doesn't exist at all. Then, then we deny a huge chunk that is there in the Bible. I mean, it's there. Angels, demons play a role in the Bible, in, in God's economy, if I can put it that way. But then sometimes people get so intrigued by it that we, we stand in danger of either worshipping angels and give them more space, more uh, honor than is due to them. Uh, John in Revelation tells us at one stage the angel was there with him, uh, helping him to see whatever it was, and, uh, and John fell down and he wanted to worship. The angel said, no, no, you don't worship me, you, you worship God. I'm just a servant, I'm just here to help you. And so the angels are there to point us to God. And so we, we don't worship angels. And when people get so intrigued and drawn into that world, uh, eventually they stand huge danger of, uh, of getting so engrossed in that world that they take their focus away from Jesus. So I would encourage us to look at Jesus. And the same thing with the demonic world. Um, I, it, it is a, it's a world that you don't go and have a look for. Uh, I know even very solid Christian ministers who have done uh, and dealt with a, a demon possession on an ongoing basis and eventually they become oppressed because it's a very, very dangerous world to get involved in. Which is why I'm saying to you, I, I just want to live with Jesus as my focus all the time. Uh, if there's something that comes my way, again, I run to Jesus as hard and fast as I possibly can. 
The other danger that I want to highlight is speculation. Um, and it's speculation about what is happening in the spiritual world. The Bible doesn't tell us every detail. It tells us enough, just enough to know, um, enough that we can know God, that we can know salvation through Jesus Christ, uh, and we probably don't have to know a, lot, know a lot more about that. But there's a real problem here, and that is when people begin to base their belief on experiences. Uh, it's very similar to near-death experiences about heaven. I'll talk about that sometime later on, but it's a sim similar kind of thing. And that is, I've had this experience when I was a non-Christian, um, the devil and I had demons and they spoke to me and they told me how, what it is like and there's a certain order among the demons and, and, and now I begin to build a whole belief system around my experience. And I'm saying, no, that's an experience and I don't accept your experience. I, it may be valid, it may be true for you, but I can't compare that with the Word of God. My only source of information about the spiritual world needs to come from the Bible, not from someone's experience. I've had that um, actually as an argument um, where a person said to me, that, uh, for example, I'll give you a quick example. The devil stole all the music, and as Christians we need to go and, f and, and take the music back. And I said to him, where, where do you read that in the Bible? No, no, no. There was an ex-Satanist who, who became a Christian, and, and this is what he told them. And I said, well, it doesn't stand in the Bible every, anywhere. Uh, and the devil has a reputation of lying anyway. So I won't believe him. Uh, even if someone says to me in so many words, I, I won't believe that anyway. So uh, it's, it's so, so dangerous to follow experiences. And then treating the devil as God's equal. I've alluded to this before. Let, let me give you an example in prayers, for example. Have you heard this kind of prayer? Lord Jesus, we praise you because we are here tonight and... Um, we, we want to worship you. And devil, we rebuke you in Jesus' name. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. What has the person just done in that prayer? Put the devil equal in these prayers or her prayers with Jesus. I'm, I'm speaking to Jesus and I'm also speaking to the devil. Actually, I have no right to speak to the devil. I, I don't want to even speak to the devil. I, I don't want to talk to him. Uh, we may talk about him. Uh, he's a real being, a spiritual being, a dangerous one. And therefore, I want to stay as far as possible from him. I want to stay as close to Jesus as possible. And so when I, when I encounter the devil, I, I, I don't see him in my mind as equal to Jesus. I, I see him as, as a as subservient, as, a, as someone who is under the authority of God, which is why he comes crawling into the throne room of God, and why he does that, and why God allows it, I don't know. But I do know that he's there. That's what Job tells us. That's what Zechariah tells us. But he reports to God. So uh, that to me is a wonderful comfort, as I said to you before. And so I, I, I revel in that. But Satan and his demons, although more powerful than humans, and therefore you and I don't, think, don't fight them bare hand. We, we never do that. Uh, we, we go to Jesus and we say, Lord Jesus, you take care of this problem. Um, so I, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing that directly. So we base our belief in and our theology about the spiritual world only on what we read in the Bible and not on our own or someone else's experience. Some of the errors related to demonology, Satan worship, um, it's real. Um, it's, it's not just a little uh, thing that someone dreamed up somewhere. People worship the devil. They Physically, Satanism exists. And so we've got to be aware of that. But of course, God is the only one worthy of our worship. And then denying evil in the world, the Bible clearly teaches that there is evil. It's a reality, and we can't deny that. Uh, Christians can't sin. Um, I've alluded to that or talked about that before. Uh, Christians do sin. We know what to do with that when we do sin. We don't live in sin, and, and that's the battle. That's the struggle within us. Um, we, we live in the presence of God. But every now and again we slip out a little bit and our minds wander and we do sin um, against God. And then 1 John 1, 9 tells us what to do. And here is a much more subtle one uh, which, may, which may even disturb you when I, even when I say it. But the devil robs us of our health and our possessions. We need to claim it back. And it's at the root of prosperity teaching. And that is, if you become a Christian, you become rich and, and, and healthy. Um, 
and, and I'm putting it very bluntly and I'm overstating the case, but that is what prosperity teaching is saying. If you're a Christian, you need to now claim your wealth in Christ and, and, and you'll become rich. Um, you just sacrifice a little bit. You sow the seeds. You see the language? It's biblical language, but it just borders on taking people off the real focus. The Bible is full of people who were poor and sick and suffering. That's reality in the Bible. And so the roots of prosperity teaching is, once I become a Christian, then everything will be honky-dory. Now, I can have a logical argument about not even a biblical one. If that is true, then we won't have any non-Christians in this world. Every non-Christian out there will be poor and sick and struggling, and all the Christians will be healthy and rich, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and there will be no sickness and, and anything else. So just pure logic should tell us that, that is not, it's simply not true. And then reality, you, you do the, the maths. You look around and you see in the world how many Christians deeply, deeply committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and they suffer either illness or a problem or uh, they poor or live in poverty because of their economic situation or whatever other situation. Now, in the context of tonight's teaching, what I need to say to you is that we live in a real fallen reality. Every day. <clears throat> we are faced with that every single day. And therefore... We do get sick, as Christians even. We, we do suffer uh, sometimes by losing our jobs. And Christians through ages and even now in certain parts of the world are being persecuted. Uh, they, they don't just live a wonderful, glorious little life on an island somewhere. We live in a real world where there are real problems around us. Those problems are a result of what we talked about tonight. The fall of mankind in Genesis chapter six, uh, 3. When we get to heaven one day, that's revelation, the picture will be complete. Then, and only then, will we live in a world where there are no more uh, sins and tears and problems and those kinds of issues. When we look at uh, some of the hymns and songs that we sing, uh, Nought have I gotten, but what I received grace hath bestowed, uh, it since I have believed, boasting excluded, pride I abase. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. And this is a building block. What, what we talked about tonight is a building block in terms of where we go when we talk about salvation. You can't understand salvation unless you know that you need to be saved. And so that's where we're heading. And then just another song through all we think and do today. Remind us, Lord, to watch and pray. And keep us from all evil, for we are weak and sin is near, but here in you we have no fear. You keep us from all evil. I want to challenge you to read those Bible uh, chapters that I referred to earlier on and do a concordance, a Bible search, either online or on software on your, your PC or if you have a physical concordance. Look up spiritual warfare, look up angels, look up demons. Uh, they, they're everywhere on, on the pages of the Bible. And then try and read up some that article I referred to or the book by Billy Graham, and those, if, if that's the area of interest uh, to you. And then uh, if you are registered for the certificate of completion next week, you need to hand in a short paper. So next time we'll look at Jesus Christ, who He is, what He came to do, and how salvation applies to us uh, as Christians. And I'll see you next week. God bless you.